Okay, everyone. So tonight I'm going to be talking about um, a project that um, I was involved with, both in the field and um, and also um, I was able to um, be heavily involved in, in in writing up, which was really great. Um, I've been involved in um, ULAS for all of its life, really, for 25 years, and I've been able to, I've been lucky enough to work on some some really interesting and fascinating projects. Um, the, the excavation part of this that I was involved with was really interesting, as you'll find out later. Um, but the um, the focus of this talk tonight is is three early Bronze Age burial monuments. So monuments that were constructed for the um, the burial of the dead between 2000 and 1500 BC in a small part of Leicestershire, as you'll see near Cosington, which some of you may know. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that this um, was a project that enabled us to, to look at three comparable monuments in, in one go. Um, quite often these monuments will be excavated as single features and the focus will be very much on that monument itself um, and without there being too much um, need really or, or, or um, opportunity to to look at the wider picture and uh, and these this this, this project was um, enabled us to, to get that bigger picture and I think it helped develop a really interesting story and um, and and sort of um, um, understanding of how these monuments might have might have been um, used in, in 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 the Bronze Age and beyond. So um, there are about 150 or so of these kind of monuments in Leicestershire. Many of them are ploughed flat, as these ones have been. Um, some of them retain a little bit of their their sort of earthwork status. So basically, they, a lot of them would have been circular ditches with which provided the upcast for a mound which covered the the body um, and so these these are the barrows we're going to be talking about this evening so you can see this is a crop mark um, picture here let me get my mouse to come back up there's a small barrow here you can see that little circle and a large one adjacent to it with this bigger double circle and both of these were excavated in the 1970s as part of um, sand and gravel extraction in, in, in a quarry at Cosington. And then in 1999, the excavation that I took part in was of this, this third barrow here, which um, took place um, within the same quarry, but a different phase of the extraction. The, um, the, the sort of um, gravel quarry had kind of ceased, paused, um, um, operations for a little while and then it then it um, geared up again and um, and this this was um, excavated as part of that before the gravel was taken away and the 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 reason why they were all brought together is because for for one reason or another the um, barrows that were excavated in the 1970s were not written up properly um, and they, they'd been pretty much sort of left on the shelf and uh, and we needed to um, properly report the new excavation and at the time um, English Heritage were providing um, money that was through a fund called the Aggregates Levy Sustainability Fund which was for this very purpose of specifically for um, excavations that have taken place in mineral quarries and also to to sort of help see through the um, the sort of um, publication of historic excavations. So we were really lucky to get that money. And as I said, pulling everything together really helped us um, understand more about the, the sites as a whole. So here we are, location for people that don't know or people that are sort of familiar with the area, just to sort of pinpoint where we are. The site is just to the north of Leicester in the East Midlands of England. Um, Next to a village, the nearest place is Cosington, a little village, um, which is also closest, closer to the, the sort of village of One Lip and slightly 
um, larger settlement of Rothley. And here they are in relation to one another. So there's the village of Cosington. These are the excavations of, from the 1970s here. This is the one that I worked on in 1999. And there are also a couple of other um, crop marks of ring ditches that are probably part of the same kind of dispersed cemetery from the early Bronze Age um, that we know as, as, as crop marks. And they sit at the junction of the rivers Reek and Saw, so the confluence zone of these rivers and the, uh, the Rothley Brook, which is coming in from, from the west. And um, all of them, all of the ones that we excavated sit on slightly raised ground above that kind of, um, that in, in the river valley there in the lower part of the river valley, quite low lying, but slightly raised within their local landscape. If we take a slightly wider view, you'll see that these barrows sit within this fantastic sort of drainage network, all of these rivers going up into the valleys and to the higher ground. Um, and you'll notice from the little white areas here, these are all crop mark remains of, of similar monuments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you'll see that the, um, the rivers and the valleys between them are very much a focal point for these monuments in this particular part of the landscape. We think this is probably um, a reflection of, of important places in the, in the Bronze Age landscape. We don't, it's, it's, a, it's a, a sort of unusual aspect of Bronze Age archaeology that we find lots and lots of evidence of where people were buried, but we don't find much evidence of where people lived. Uh, if you go forward in time into the Iron Age, it flips around and we find lots of evidence of where people lived, but not so much of where people were buried. So there's, there's sort of contrasting evidence, but for the, the Bronze Age, a lot of the evidence that we get for where people were moving around, where people were living, is from flint scatters, um, often uh, in the higher grounds that come up through field walking, etc. And um, the general impression is that even though we're kind of fairly on into sort of prehistory by then, and a lot of the land would have been cleared, that um, there was still perhaps a, a sort of mixed subsistence um, kind of lifestyle going on, perhaps mixing a bit of sedentary farming with um, still, you know, sort of incorporating some of the movement around the landscape um, that people would have done in earlier times. And, and, and potentially these, uh, these low lying areas here at the confluence zones would have been really important meeting places for where different groups of people, different communities could have come together at certain times of the year and potentially that could have incorporated um, you know not only movement of people but movement of animals as well and if they were moving herds of cattle around etc they, they could have used these low-lying areas for pasture it would have been a fantastic resource um, at certain times of the year so this may have been the, the sort of impetus really for the development of these barrow cemeteries especially the ones that we're going to talk about this evening one of the um, important aspects of, of this is that we're able to sort of build up quite a nice um, picture of the, the surrounding environment at the time, the contemporary environment, because there were some um, couple of paleo channels, these ancient river, that, the reef, river um, and stream channels that had silted up. And um, this is our um, um, earlier um, environmental specialist, Angela Moncton taking a, a column sample for pollen remains from the bo bottom of one of these um, channels. And it, it gave us some fantastic information about what the um, contemporary environment was like. It indicated that there was still quite a lot of um, wildwood hanging around, but also that there'd been um, significant impacts onto that by the people that were living and moving around in, in, the, in the surrounding area that um, clearance had taken place and new, new sort of species had started to um, colonize in the area. And um, also there was lots of charcoal indicating people's activities in the area and animal bone. Um, 
within that as well, indicating activity going on. So very much a kind of transformative kind of um, landscape, if you like, coming away from the old wild woods um, and, and, you know, with clearance op opening up the, the trees and opening up past areas for these monuments to develop in, but also, you know, increasing access to facilitate movement around the landscape for people and animals as well. So it's a very kind of interesting um, early sort of part in the development of, of, of large scale clearance going on at the time these, these monuments are being um, used, created and used. And this is um, what first of a series of reconstruction paintings that um, a colleague of mine, Debbie Miles Williams, um, did for us for this project. And you'll see as we go along, that, um, she produced some, some, some great pieces of work that really kind of bring this some of these images to life. So this is um, her depiction of the three monuments um, all together with that you can see the sort of trackways between them where people would have moved to and from and by and past them as part of their their daily and yearly routine and the fact that some of the woods were still persisting at the time. I would imagine that the sort of um, yearly and you know the annual and daily movement of people within this landscape would have really kind of and the fact that the you know, potential fact that they met um, at certain times of the year in this spot where the, the monuments were created really kind of gave this place a special feeling to the the people that were moving around and using this area it became you know probably became, became quite a um, a sort of memorable place that would have been tied in with the stories of people's interactions with different communities in the landscape and and the stories of different families and that kind of thing and and the creation and the use of those monuments would have added to that however it we can't uh, the, the indication is that people were there before um the bronze age people were there so there's these this is um just a picture of some of the flints, flint tools that were picked up as part of the excavations. These are sort of Mesolithic tools at the top, so sort of 10,000 years BC, uh, all the way through into sort of Neolithic times as well. So just, you know, in, in the sort of thousand years or so before the early Bronze Age. So this was a, a landscape that was really heavily used, well, it was you. It had a long history of use um, for a very long period of time, and and you know even as as that sort of use heightened and became more and more um, um, frequent, then you know that 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 would have imbued the place with um, special memories and things like that. And that I'm sure that would have been something that was taken on into the early Bronze Age, and and even you know this this was a, a very well used landscape. And people frequent, frequented it very much. So moving on to the monuments then, um, this is an, ex an aerial excava uh, photo of the excavation in the 1970s of the two, the two barrows. There's the smaller one here, which we call, I've called Barrow 1, and the larger one, Barrow 2. And you'll see that um, this is on sand and gravel. All of these crop, the sort of shapes in the in the background here, are all um, sort of geological shapes where there's been sort of ice cracks and things like that in the you know way back into the ice age when the gravel was freezing and thawing, and you get this kind of very sort of characteristic polygonal um, sort of shapes in 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 the crop marks. But these these two circular monuments really stand out. So Barrow Wom was about sort of 16 meters in diameter. Um, if you look at it on the crop mark uh, and you know you look at it on the plan, which you'll see in a minute, it seems pretty simple. And a lot of these monuments, when you look at them at face value, do seem quite simple and easy to understand. But um, as you'll see, the the sort of excavation that unpicked all of the detail of these um, three feet. Uh, Burial, burial mounds and monuments 
um, really showed that there was a lot going on uh, and, and longevity of, of use, which makes this a really interesting kind of topic to look at. Um, so this is this, this next uh, picture of it after it's been almost fully excavated. Um, and it was found that the, the outer ditch actually consisted of two um, ditches. So it had been enlarged and remodeled at some point in the early Bronze Age. And you can see in the picture over here, there's a person excavating the inner one. And there's the outer one, a little bit shallower. And you can see from the, um, the cross section here, which is the same as here, the earlier one is much more pronounced. And it was actually found in excavation that it had been recut before it had gone, it, it, it had completely silted up. So the original monument had been um, created in the early Bronze Age. It had almost silted up. Then it had been redefined. And then that had silted up. Uh, and then the monument itself again was, was completely redefined. So even, even just by looking at the ditches, you can tell that there's an awful lot of effort gone into keeping this monument alive and sort of reinvigorating it with um, whatever energy the Bronze Age people were putting into it and keeping it um, a, a living monument for the, the, their ancestors. And you can see this is a cross section, this is a drawn cross section of the, um, the two ditches here. So this is the earlier one with the all the recuts in it. And then it was sort of superseded by this slightly shallower one. That's not the only interesting part of the story though. So if you look at the um, image on the left here, this is a kind of sequential um, plan that I've done to show how, how the monument developed. So in, originally there was a circular ditch surrounding um, a burial. We think it was a burial. It was a grave shaped pit, but unfortunately a lot of the the human remains, almost all of the human remains on this site were, were, were non-existent because the sand and gravel was very acid rich and the, and the bones just don't survive from that long ago. Um, so um, this is a grave shaped pit. It's assumed to be a burial. We, we don't really know, but um, given the context of the, the situation, it seems fair enough to assume that. Um, as I said, after a while, the, um, the ditch, the original ditch began to, to silt up, but not before, I have to get my cursor back, not, not before a number of um, charcoal deposits were laid in the ditch itself. And um, these have been radiocarbon dated. They're contemporary with the original, more or less the original use of the monument. The original um, interpretation of these was that they were somehow sort of um, evidence of transient occupation and that people were using the in slightly infilled ditch as um, a shelter for um, having hearths and things like that as they were moving around. But more recent um, interpretation of these kind of deposits has um, suggested that they might indeed be actually purposeful deposits of pyre material that came from um, cremation burials. And we know that in the Bronze Age, people were cremated as well as they were buried as whole bodies. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any cremation burials to actually go with these, these deposits, um, but it's possible because the uh, monument was plowed flat, that those, were, those burials may have been placed in a mound that covered the internal area. <clears throat> but um, the species of um, um, wood that was used all seems to be fairly reminiscent of, of species that were used in, in, in pyre material in, from other sites, based on other sites. After this, um, these deposits were placed, that, that ditch actually became completely filled in. It silted all the way up. Um, and then after... Once it had silted up, this feature here, F4, there was a little pit dug into the top of the silted in up ditch, the infilled ditch, which contained the cremated remains of, of a human individual. And this was radiocarbon dated, and it actually came back with a Neolithic date 
which is our Neolithic mystery in the title on the on the um, slide. And this is really unusual because we know that this is a an early Bronze Age monument. We know we have an early Bronze Age date from the um, charcoal deposits that were underlying this, this this pit. So what does this mean? Could it be that the um, I mean, the, the, um, the analysis of the, the bones indicated very strongly that this was, was, a, was all, all the bones were from one single individual. It wasn't complete um, and the date was, was a Neolithic date. So could it be that this was a disturbed cremation that was found when they were digging or redigging this ditch? Um, and for whatever reason, they were reburied with some reverence at the end of this. It's almost like a closure deposit to this particular phase of the of the monument. And it may have been that um, if people were involved in cremating their dead at that time, which seems to be the case, they recognised that this was a cremation and um, of a human person and, and reburied it with some sort of feeling behind it. Um, but we can't really understand what those thought processes might have been, but it could be that they picked up these bones, <clears throat> um, either thought it was an earlier Bronze Age burial that they hadn't, um, you know, that someone else had uh, deposited, or it could have been that they realised that they were older than the activities that were taking place, and they were placed in the ground as a, a reference to ancestors and um, people that had trodden and lived in this area before. We can't really know for sure, but this is an interesting aspect of, of this particular barrow that these, these old ancient bones by then were already, you know, that they were treated in the same way as they would have been, as, as a contemporary burial would have, would have been. It also helps us to think about perhaps, you know, what people in the past thought of, of history. So, you know, how did people in, in our prehistory think of their own history? And it's not something we, we always sort of think about really. So um, following the complete infilling of this, this inner ditch, at some point at, uh, later in the early Bronze Age, the, the, the barrow was, was redefined. It was completely redug. As you can see, the ditch itself sort of skirted around the edge of the earlier monument. So they're making a conscious reference to that earlier monument, they're reinvigorating it, presumably for um, reuse. And uh, again, you know, we haven't got any burials associated with this phase of the monument, but it could all, they could all have been within the um, the mound itself that has long been ploughed ploughed away. Um, but but yeah, definitely just sort of honing in on that early monument. So they're really conscious of what it was there for. And, uh, and wanting to, to, to revive it. And then finally, in the um, early Middle Bronze Age, so a good few hundred years after the original monument had been created, it became the focus of another cemetery, a different type of cemetery, another cremation cemetery, but very clearly just wanting to be alongside the original monument, not wanting to impinge on it, but just just being alongside it and making that association with, again, potentially that ancestral association with earlier people and earlier use that had used the site. So this was um, a cemetery that was in, in, in use between, you know, 80 and 360 years, according to radiocarbon dates. And that sort of time span is actually illustrated in the, um, the range of different burial traditions that we see and the types of pottery that are used in the, in the cremations. As you can see from the photos, the, um, this was found at the very limit of, of um, survival and any, I think, you know, a, another season of ploughing and all of this evidence would have been lost. So I'm really lucky to have this information, slight as it is, um, but the plan tells us an awful lot about what was going on. Um, so some of the burials were placed in inverted urns, and that's this one here. So you can see that's the top of an urn that's been placed upside down. And you can see it's been ploughed away to the point where you can see the remains of the, the, the human bones inside. And there's the pot. You can see the decoration, beautiful chevron decoration on it there. And these are all of the, what we call the Deverall Rimbury tradition of, of burials. 
And there's another one. This is, I think, the base of a pot, just about, with the cremated bone inside. Oh, it's an upside, another upside down one. You can see a different decoration on it. And there's another one with um, quite big bits of cremated bone in. Some of them are buried with um, the remains of stone kists, so the a sort of stone lined box. So this is the the very base um, stone of a, a a little sort of compartment in which the burial was placed, not inside a, a pot, but just inside a stone box. And some of them were more deeply buried. So this one, sort of F twenty four at the top of the picture here, survived a little bit more than some of the other ones. And there's the there's the pot for that one. So you can see that all of these burials, even though they probably represent quite a long um, tradition of people coming back and reusing this and interring their dead in association with this earlier monument, they all kind of they're all quite separate. So potentially there were markers in the ground for people to know not to disturb the earlier burials. Um, and this is Debbie's interpretation of of, of that cemetery be, being used. So you can see the different traditions going on. Here's a, there's a pot going into a stone line box. Um, others being placed in upright pots, but you know, potentially piles of stones, potentially wooden markers uh, in the ground to, to define where the previous burials have been. And again, this sort of repeated return to Barrow one to reinter that to inter their dead in this way really sort of shows that people were interested in coming back and reusing and it implies certain social memory of the communities that were, were using this and the sort of repeated visits would have helped build their bonds as a community and then you know and their kind of ties to the the Cosington landscape. So um, Barrow two is a is a completely different kind of monument. Um, it's much larger. It's about sort of um, 30 metres across in the central ring and um, sort of 40 metres across on the outer ring. It's a bit of a difficult one to understand because we don't know whether these two ditches were contemporary uh, or, or certainly whether they must have been contemporary at some point, but we don't know when whether they were built as a pair at the beginning. Um, but certainly the inner ring, as with the ring ditch of Barrow 1, was really heavily reworked. So it had been in use for a long time, it had been re-dug um, and, and, and maintained for a reasonable period of time. Um, and then the, um, if, if, if it is the case that the outer one was um, added at a later date, you can see that it mimics the, the shape um, of, of the inner one very precisely. And you can also see that unlike Barrow 1, it's not a complete sort of circle. It's more of an angular um, um, sort of design that approximates a circle, but is essentially a series of angular ditches joined together. Um, and it has been noted on other um, similar monuments that where the, t where the angles join, they don't always join together completely neatly. And it's, it's been, often been speculated that the creation of these types of monuments in this particular shape was a result of gang work. So different groups of people digging particular sections of the, the surrounding ditch. And it's tempting to speculate that perhaps this could have been different family groups with, you know, if we think about how, what we've just been sort of talking about uh, in terms of how the community is involved in using these monuments. It may have been that things like this and with Barrow 1 and as we see Barrow 3, that these were community investments, if you like, and people came together to um, just to help build them and maintain them at certain times of the year. Um, if they're all going to be used by the community, why not? You know, that's, that, that seems to be a good investment of labour. And by doing that, you know, and, and the constant kind of re um, renovation of them and maintenance of them, digging the ditches, cutting the turfs to go on the mound, that kind of thing. They would have been really good moments in time to sort of bring that community together. Uh, and it might have been at the times when different communities came down 
into the bottom of the river valleys to to meet um you know where the rivers join that kind of thing and um that could have been when they they pulled their labor to to create these monuments but this one is really interesting because it tells that it's probably broadly contemporary maybe slightly later with than barrow one but um it, it tells a, a similar picture of changing burial traditions you can see that um there's a lot of lot of features within the um, the center of the inner ditch um it may not have been originally something that had a, a mound over it it's it's big it's too big and the ditches are, too, are shallower that um you know there wouldn't it wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have allowed for creation of that amount of soil to create a mound, but maybe that was a kind of meeting place, uh, like an arena, that kind of thing originally. Um, but eventually it became used for burials. The first burial, um, which is um, F14, oh sorry, F17, just off centre here, was another cremation burial, but this was a very different kind of cremation burial to the ones we've just talked about. <clears throat> you can see it was quite well preserved, um, a very tight rectangular um, sort of arrangement of cremated bone within a, um, an oblong pit, um, um, sort of held in place by, um, you know, a series of stones around the edges. And the idea being there that perhaps it was in a box or an organic container that um, had, had long been um, decayed. But you know the the shape of it had been maintained by the, um, the cremated bone. Um, also within the bone uh, and in association with it was a number of um, broken sherds of beaker pottery. So this is an early uh, late Neolithic, early early Bronze Age kind of pottery, which would have been ancient at the time of this burial, according to the radiocarbon date. So it's potentially um, a situation that the 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 beaker pottery was was given away as part of a, the burial rite, uh, almost like an heirloom. It may have been something that was curated by the community or the family, uh, and bits and pieces of it were interred with the this person um, as part of the burial rite. And we'll see in later um, burials that sort of grave goods is a particular thing with the Bronze Age burials, for whatever reason. Oops, I've gone the wrong way. So the second burial, which was more central, is this F15 here. And this, again, a different burial. This was a, um, an inhumation, so um, a burial of a complete person, non-burned person. And as I said, the, the um, acidic soils are really not very good for, for, for bones, but you can just about see the remains of leg bones an arm bones down here of this <clears throat> individual who was a small child. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to um, assign a gender because of the state of the preservation, but the, um, the size of the bones indicates that this was a child of about eight, eight years old. Um, and they were buried in a crouch position at the bottom of this large pit in the center of the monument with a range of very interesting grave goods. Um, the larger pot here is known as a food vessel, and here it is, you can see this fantastic sort of decoration again, and that was off to the side in the burial. Um, at, the, at, the, at the child's head was a lovely flint knife, which is shown here. And at the, at the feet end of the, um, the grave was another little accessory cup also in the, the food vessel tradition. And a very interesting sort of stone, limestone carved cup, which has a similar kind of decoration on it. So there is some sort of association between the pot and the stone cup and another couple of flint knives. <clears throat> I'm thinking about um, people's perceptions of the past. The, the central um, flint knife here is really interesting because it's actually a reused Neolithic piece. So the people that buried this person had, had actually picked up a piece of their past, uh, their, their prehistory, if you like, and, um, and reworked it to, in, in the shape of a, um, 
a tool that they would have used in their contemporary life, but it eventually found its way into the grave of this child. And here's a close up of those. So these are the, here's the food vessel with this sort of incised, lovely decoration around, fantastic piece of pottery. And this, and here's the accessory vessel. And you can just about see the, the indentations on there. And it's, it's got little lugs. So I don't know if you can see, there's a lug on this side. It survives quite well. It's not so well on the other side and they've been pierced with a stick. Um, some interpretations of these are that they could have contained incense and been swung around at the, the funeral side, at the burial side that joined the funeral. So potentially that was what was going on here. Potentially the, the larger vessel could have contained food or, or um, drink to help the person through in the afterlife, that kind of thing. Um, and the flint tools. Well, that's an interesting one really, because if you think about the, um, the age of the person, it, make, it, it, it sort of forces us to think about what childhood might have been in the Bronze Age. You know, it may not have been particularly the same as what, what we would envisage it. Um, you know, a person of eight years old now, maybe they're not, certainly in my house, they're, <laughs> they're not doing too many of the jobs around the house, but maybe um, in the Bronze Age, people, you know, were, were more engaged in, 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 everybody had to be engaged, but a lot of these things indicate a person of high status. So um, it's interesting um, to think about what these grave good, goods mean. Do they actually indicate the status of the person that we see in the grave or are they more of a projection of what the family wants this, you know, the onlookers to, to see in the grave? And could it be more of a reflection of the status of the people that are left um, as, as part of the living community? It's a really interesting kind of thing you can't really ever answer, um, but they're, you know, it does show that there are multiple ways of reading um, things that you find in the grave. And this is um, Debbie's interpretation of that with the people laying down the objects around, uh, around the, the individual person. If anybody's local to the area or is visiting um, Loughborough, the Charmwood Museum actually has uh, a recreation of this burial, which is very kind of sensitively done. Um, and you can see the, um, all of the finds that we just talked about in, in real life in, in, in the display cases, well worth a visit. Um, it's a fantastic museum, but um, there's a really nice sort of renewed um, display about the, about the Cosm Cosington burials that has only just opened, so it's well worth a visit. The, um, so that burial wasn't the end of burials and deposits. Um, and as with Barrow One, the monument continued to be used even beyond um, the early Bronze Age. So there were more, a couple more um, deposits of, of food vessels, which are probably more contemporary with um, the original, the burial we, we just talked about. So F16 here, there was a, a burial of um, a pot just to the south of the, the child burial, which probably could have been another offering perhaps towards the, the burial. And similarly, uh, there was another um, food vessel that was, was uh, buried somewhere up here somewhere. Oh, F18, I think. So just sort of close, close by. And potentially by this point, that central burial could have contained a, uh, could have been marked by a small mound, just sort of um, demarcating where that burial was. And we know, and th this is this is also hinted at because these later burials of collared urns, um, F15A, was actually a pot that was just sat above the child burial. So potentially that was a sort of later tradition of pottery and people coming back and remembering what that burial was and, and yeah, potentially who that was and, and putting something in the ground as a, as a token. Again, um, this is just a, a pot on its own. It could have contained food. It could have contained some sort of offering to the gods, that kind of thing. Um, but F14, just to the north here, was another burial uh, and another really interesting burial because it was a cremation burial, but the pottery was just sat alongside it. And this was in a pit that had two levels. So the cremation, you can just about see with the white in this photo, 
was in the lower part of the pit and the pot was sat on a ledge overlying it. Um, it, had, it had rocked over by the time it came to be excavated, but potentially it was standing up upright in the pit when at the time of burial. <clears throat> and this is another kind of way that the Bronze Age people had of, 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 of burying people. It's another, it seems to be another tradition potentially. It, you know, it's a tradition that's developed at a later date, but it possibly marks the association of this particular person, whoever it was, with a pot that they were um, you know, connected to. So all of these things are sort of giving us hints of how people thought, how they wanted to sort of portray um, the dead and, and their own sort of um, communities within the things that they put into burials and how they displayed them. And this isn't the only um, um, example of that kind of thing. Um, there are a couple of really nice examples, um, in particular this one at Eton, which is not too far away from where I live in Melton Mowbray, just, just to the north of, of Melton, um, in, in sort of northern Leicestershire. And this is a great example of, of this reuse. It started off, as with Barrow 1, a fairly simple monument with a, um, a burial in the centre, all very, all very nice and, and neat. You'll note that there was a, they left an entrance in this one so that people could come back to it. So potentially there was a, not so much of a big mound in the middle there, but perhaps a, a smaller mound that people could come in and pay their respects, etc. But over time, the burials were added to, and you can see the, the spot in the middle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and this is a second burial, a third burial, a fourth burial. And you can see that each time a new burial is inserted, a new ditch is dug. So they're reinvigorating, re redefining that monument for the new, new burial and creating that sort of special place to the community. Um, perhaps as a, a mark of respect to the dead. Um, but I mean, ultimately, by the time you get to the end of the sequence, you've got this fantastic sort of monument there to the, the community's dead that's stretching back for an awful long time and connecting those people to that piece of the landscape which is kind of fitting in with some of the things I've just been talking about with the other monuments as well. This one at Lockington is really interesting because this is one that has a really long history of, of use and it started out life as um, a special place in the Neolithic. So there were Neolithic pits and early Bronze Age deposits here surrounded by um, a palisade slot, so a wooden fence. And uh, there was also a beaker pit in the, uh, just on the edge here, which contains some, some fantastic metalwork, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but that later became the, um, the setting for uh, a Bronze Age barrow, which again became re-dug and re-dug and re-dug. And, and, and just given this sense of um, sort of community engagement in the, in the landscape and this long-term um, investment by the people that, uh, that were using it. And these are the these fantastic gold armlets that came from this pit, completely unusual and um, the like of which has never been seen in Leicestershire again. But again, probably high status burial that's associated with the cremation. Um, but um, just shows that even these simple monuments can sometimes have some fantastic remains hidden within them. So the third burial, this is the one that Barrow, and this is the one that I was involved with. You can see that we saw, uh, we looked at a, a wider landscape view. Um, here's the Barrow itself. There's a whole series of boundary ditches over to the um, east and settlement remains to the north and west. And we'll talk about those in a bit. But the um, this was interesting because as with the one that we just looked at in Lockington, there was evidence of, um, earlier activity, which probably made this a special place and, a, and, a, and possibly a reason why this Bronze Age monument was placed there itself. So these black dots are the remains of um, Neolithic pits. <clears throat> they weren't very well dated, but they certainly were underneath the barrow. The important thing about this Bronze Age barrow, in, a, in comparison to the ones we've just looked at, it, it wasn't completely ploughed away. So some vestiges of the mound remained and are protected 
quite a lot of the archaeology underneath. So a lot of these were random pits in a cluster. But over here, you can see a slightly more um, deliberate pattern. And we think this is the remains of a pit, pit, what's known as a pit circle. And these are Neolithic monuments, which are not very well understood. They're often associated with burials. Um, but another one was found in Rutland, at, uh, close to Oakham. And you'll see they're slightly larger than the one that we found at Cosington, but a similar kind of shape. And they're thought to be the sort of large post holes for a timber circle, that kind of thing. This one had three phases, so it started out life as a sort of elliptical shape, then became enlarged with a, almost like a, a pronounced entrance feature here. So potentially it was a sort of arena where people came to gather. Um, then it became a smaller feature. But ultimately, as with Cosington, it became the setting for a, a Bronze Age round burrow. So the, again, that's sort of echoing this association between the monuments and hinting again that these places, once they become special and used, um, they became um, a setting for later activities of a similar kind of um, a, a similar kind of um, uh, association. So. Um, these are some photos of us excavating the uh, Barrow 3 and you can see the um, there's the big ditch coming all the way around again this was something that had been redug several times so that investment of labour to keep it alive to, to the people that were using it and you can see that um, we've left these these um, sections in here to to record the the overlying mound, you can see it sort of st stood to a good sort of half a metre at its maximum height, but that it had spread, the ploughing had actually spread it um, over the ditch. So you couldn't see the ditch to start with and only revealed itself as we came down through the layers. This was one that we didn't really find any central burial with. Um, we don't know a reason for that. It could have been that it was uh, very, it was very sandy on this side. It could have been it wasn't visible. It could have been that the, the, the monument was um, um, created as a, as a sort of cenotaph feature with no burial. It could have been in, in, in memory of people that died, or it could have been that a lot of the um, information had been removed by ploughing away of the upper parts of the mound. We just don't know. But what we did find on the way around as we went along is um, certain clusters of stone which are very very unusual and I know it doesn't look much but in the context of the the um, very extremely sandy uh, mound material that they, they really stood out they could have been little markers for, for burials that we have long gone another one here but on the on the southern side a very kind of um, much more sort of pronounced um, cluster of stone which seemed to be in a kind of elongated, potentially grave shaped um, arrangement. And as we um, went down, it's extremely difficult to, to, to de decipher where the edges of this um, feature was, but um, eventually uh, it was revealed that there was a, a sort of a grave shaped cut within it, which presumably had, the, had once held the remains of a person now long gone. However, some of the grave goods did remain. So there was a really nice flint knife, um, but most spectacularly up at the, um, where we assume the head end would have been, this amazing um, Bronze Age necklace. And this is one of only two from the entire East Midlands. And it's worth dwelling on this a little for a moment because it, again, this, this is a beautiful object. Um, it's really finely crafted, but it, it has its own story to tell. So this is what's known as a composite bead necklace. They're pretty common in other areas of, of Britain, particularly in Wessex and Scotland, um, where they're most found. They're, they're often um, associated with cremation burials, but where they have been found with inhumations, they've often been found with females. And I don't want to kind of assign a gender because we haven't really found a body obviously but you know based on the the sway of the evidence potentially this was the the burial of quite a high-ranking female at that time 
um, and potentially sort of emulating fashions that are more readily available in other parts of the country. What, what that really means, we don't know. It could have been that they were adopting those kind of fashions. It could have been this was a person who came from one of those areas, which we, we just can't tell. But the interesting part about these um, objects is that they're actually, in, as, in, as is the, uh, suggested in the name, they're, they're a composite arrangement of, of different elements uh, and potentially of different, originally from different necklaces. Um, with different stories to tell. So what we're looking at here, the um, the majority of the beads are made from amber and these are all so well made and unworn that it is thought that they were all made as a set. So they, they, they came as a set. Um, this is a, um, a jet bead, which the original um, sort of resource for that would have been from um, Whitby in the north. This is a shale bead, which um, the raw materials for that would have come from Kimmeridge, further down south in Dorset. And this is actually um, made of faience, which is like an early kind of glass paste kind of thing, which solidifies. This is actually uh, interesting. It's, it was chosen as a centerpiece, but originally it should have been a sort of barrel shape like the jet and the um, shale bead. But for some reason, the mix was too loose and it's kind of drooped down but this doesn't seem to have attract, detracted from the fact that it was um, used as a centerpiece so this is how they would have been strung. Um, the faience bead is, is potentially the only local um, locally made piece of this whole necklace if you think about where the, um, the, the sources came from. In terms of the, the sources for the amber they could have been washed up on the, they could have been, that, that material could have been found washed up on the East Coast, but more likely it was imported from um, sort of we, uh, West Coasts of, of Europe and sort of Holland, that kind of area. So one of the stories or, you know, one, one of the things that this, this um, necklace may have been trying to portray is the wide connections that this person had or the community had. Um, that uh, this has all been brought together to, to represent that. It could have been that this is a representation of um, people that came to the funeral and they put the, put the um, necklace together at the graveside, as in, as in Debbie's picture here. It could have been, um, you know, representative of the, the much wider Bronze Age community and the, and the connections that the, 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 the local people had with other areas in the in the country and that in turn sort of helps us to think about you know that um, people weren't could have been very outward looking in the Bronze Age probably not something you, you immediately think of but the connections were there for these materials to be floating around and getting traded up and down the country and indeed from other countries so that's a really interesting aspect as well. Um, the amber and the, um, the jet also have um, you know, perceived healing qualities. So potentially they could have been included in this necklace to sort of help with the passage of this person into the afterlife. You know, they, they you know, jet and amber have sort of electrostatic qualities and potentially the people in the Bronze Age were aware of this or, you know, had, had their own kind of beliefs about what these materials represented and what they could do for, um, you know, the living people and the dead so you know but clearly they've been very carefully chosen to be um, represented in in this grave so a really interesting kind of another aspect of what we can tell from grave goods really uh, about status and beliefs now Bron uh, barrow three was a really interesting had a really interesting later story um in in contrast to the other barrows that we looked at um, earlier on, possibly because it was slightly bigger than some of the other, the other two, possibly because it had survived as a, an earthwork for longer. In the later Bronze Age though, a good few hundred years after it had been um, sort of gone out of, of use as a, a Bronze Age burial ground, um, it became the focus for um, the local flint nappers. And this, all of the dots that you can see on here 
are um, the remains of um, flakes and cores and and um, debris that and people making flint tools in the later Bronze Age left behind. And it was very noticeable that there was a clear concentration on that mound. And you can really see it, can't you? And some of this stuff would have been sort of dispersed by the, the ploughing, the later ploughing. But potentially there was some sort of um, either memory or connection with these later Bronze Age people that they knew that um, what this mon monument represented and that may have been something that yeah, may have sort of given them some sort of superstitions about the place that they wanted to, to sort of be connected with. It could be that it was just a pleasant spot to sit in the sunshine making flint tools. We'll, we'll never really know, but clearly there is a concentration there which uh, on this particular monument, which is quite unusual. And going further into the, into, you know, into more recent past in the sort of late Bronze Age and early Iron Age, this is when, you know, much of the land would have been cleared by then in contrast to, you know, at the beginning of our story, really. And um, this is when the land started to be carved up, boundaries started to appear. Um, and Barrow 3 seems to have played its part in, in setting up the local boundary system as well for that early land allotment. You can see all of these ditches cutting across and these this post alignment, all really interesting, a lot of very kind of active, um, busy area. Um, but if you look at the aerial photo, you'll see there's Barrow 3 as a crop mark and it sits nicely within the, the crossing point of these early boundaries. So potentially it was used as a landmark um, for, you know, in part for setting out these earlier boundaries. Also within them, and quite close to the barrow, was this unusual little enclosure, which we think is sort of Iron Age or Roman in dates. It wasn't very well dated, but it's that kind of period. Um, we don't really know what it, what it was for. It's quite enigmatic, um, but there are some interesting um, parallels. There's an early, early Roman one here from Church Lawford in, in Warwickshire which was seen as a, a sort of little shrine or something similar like that. Similar arrangement at Sutton Common in Lincolnshire, and this is mid to late Iron Age. You can see the similarities in shape and size. Um, as I say, they're all pretty enigmatic, but they do appear to be associated with kind of sort of um, religious activity, burial activity, that kind of thing. Um, so potentially there is an association there with the um, proximity of this feature to, um, to Barrow 3, which is interesting in the development of the landscape. But even more so, Iron Age and Roman activity developed um, and a little settlement grew up close to the Barrow with enclosures to the north. Nice little roundhouse just to the edge. And, um, and clearly, there was some association being made here with the barrow. By this time, I'm sure that um, sort of people's memories of what Barrow 3 was originally for was probably, that probably wasn't a factor that was involved, but maybe there was some sort of superstitions about what it, uh, what it may have been, because clearly there was a sort of focus of attention on the barrow, and that was marked by a whole series of um, pottery deposits, some complete, some broken, all throughout the Iron Age and the Roman period. Um, this is the best example. That's from over here. And here's the pot reconstructed, but potentially all of these um, contained offerings to either the ancestors or whatever gods they thought sort of inhabited or were associated with this earlier monument. Um, and it, it's interesting because even though there doesn't see, it, it must have been something that sort of, I can't imagine that sort of given such an amount of time from the Bronze Age through to the Iron Age that there would have been any memory of this, social memory, but clearly there was something that urged people to, to, to place deposits in this mound. But even from the Iron Age into the Roman period, it became something of a local tradition. So Barrow III in its own way, 
kind of supported and 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 helped this new local tradition of of um, sort of reference to indirect reference to the dead and the ancestors helped it to develop. This also carried on into the early Anglo-Saxon period where, you know, if there had been this tradition, it may have held on as a sort of dim memory into the, into the early Anglo-Saxon period. Again here, another settlement developed in association with um, Barrow Three, but most importantly, it became the, the setting for uh, a new cemetery, so a new tradition again of burial within this monument, but but hundreds, if not thousands of years later in the early Anglo-Saxon period. Um, and this was um, represented by a series of burials all within the mound. Uh, again, that you know they hadn't survived very well the human bone at all, long since gone, but um, thankfully with Anglo-Saxon burials, they're often buried with um, lots of metalwork and, and, and fine. So we were able to work out where they were. This is a nice one here with a, um, a sword and a, and a knife going down the edge of the burial. Um, there are also these burnt stone pits on the edge of the mound, which may have been associated with feasting activities of, as part of the burial rite. It's interesting that they're um, they're very grave shaped in themselves, so they may have been mimicking the shapes of the graves um, of, the, of the people that were interred within the Bronze Age monument. And there was some fantastic um, evidence on the, um, on the metalwork itself for some of the organic remains that we don't normally see <clears throat> that have been um, preserved in the, in the, in the um, kind of rust of, of the object, of the iron object. So this is, you can see hopefully sort of the impressions of a leather scabbard that were on, uh, that would have been holding this knife, uh, even more exciting, these spearheads, uh, and they would have been wrapped in cloth or potentially they're the, you know, part of the cloak that um, the person would have been wearing or their, their, their tunic or whatever. Um, but this fantastic sort of Zed spun cloth uh, wrapped around the, the longer piece that you can see, and there's a close-up there. Incredible detail of this, these textile impressions just preserved in the, um, in, in the corrosion. Even um, the preserved um, shaft of the, the spearheads as well. So this is the remains of uh, the maple pole that would have, would have um, had the, the spearhead on the end. So giving us some really good indication not only of um, sort of cloth techniques in the in the period, but also um, you know, sort of environmental um, evidence as well. Little beads, little um, sort of personal objects that were buried with the people, and again this brooch that would have held a, um, a, a clothing together as how as retained this fantastic evidence for the cloth that. Um, would have been um, around the bodies when they were buried. So this is um, something that isn't um, an unusual tradition, but it's the, it was the first time that it was um, found in Leicestershire. So clearly sort of Bronze Age barrows were um, important as, as areas of burial for the early Anglo-Saxons. And, and again, we, we don't really know why, it may have been that they were there were these kind of long and distant associations if if, if similar practices that practices had taken place in the Iron Age and the Roman period. Um, we, we know also though that the the native Anglo-Saxons buried their their dead uh, in their in their origins um, homelands in in earthen mounds, and it may have been that they they saw these and made that association between the two. But this, um, since we've, we've done these sites, there's one of the other um, circular crop marks that, that I showed you at the very beginning, just to the south of these three has been, uh, has also been excavated. And um, fascinatingly, that also has quite an interesting long history of use. Um, here's the original Bronze Age burial mound shown by the ditch. Uh, and this is all the Iron Age activity that, that carried on after it, and you can see that the, the remains of the, the burial mound actually became incorporated into the corner 
of this um, Iron Age enclosure and the activity took place in and around it, but using, they were definitely making a connection with the past, but also using that as part of their, the architecture of their settlement. And then even further on, as with um, Cosington, and this is only less than a mile away, really, from the ones we've just been talking about, it became the focus for um, a further Anglo-Saxon cemetery. So this does seem to be very much a local tradition, not only with the Anglo-Saxon reuse of these mounds, but certainly going back into the, even into the Iron Age, that people were clearly associating themselves with these earlier monuments. Just finally, there's a really great sort of um, site in Rutland as well, just on the edge of um, Oakham, which really sort of pulls all this together in a way. Um, this is um, a geophysical survey of um, a lovely sort of compact round barrow cemetery. There's at least sort of seven. You can see there very clearly, if not more, maybe a couple more here. A lot of these other marks are um, geological um, anomalies, but the very dark ones are the remains of um, these sort of later prehistoric land boundaries. You can see they've been, again, as with Barrow 3 that we talked about, they've been using the, these as landmarks to sort of focus the boundaries on. But again, they became the focus for um, an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. And, uh, and these fantastic objects were found through metal detecting. So it's really lovely. Um, sort of buckle or clasp and, uh, and a fantastic sort of metal, uh, copper alloy bowl which is really unusual and, and, and quite high status that was found in association with these monuments. There's not been too much excavation work there but it's clear that these were sort of later insertions into an earlier Bronze Age monument. So just to sort of round up then, um, these, uh, these monuments at Cossington, they were created in, um, in well-trodden environments in the, in the river valleys. They, they would have been um, used and, and repeatedly um, visited in these, these areas where people came to meet. Um, and these probably would have been part of the, uh, the daily and seasonal movements of people and animals in the uh, in the in the early Bronze Age, so it would have been really important part of the landscape for them to meet, to you know, eventually to bury their dead and later to commemorate their dead. Not only would have been an important part of the, for the living community, but also for the, for the ancestral community as well. But these are areas that would have been um, important from Neolithic activity as well. Um, so the sort of memory of that use of the landscape probably helped sort of um, engage the Bronze Age people within these, uh, these movements and, and, and use of this, this part of the land. So the creation of, of the monuments here may have helped the remains and memories of the dead uh, in this important place in the landscape and the regular journeys past them would have helped strengthen the, the ties of the local community to this particular piece of the land. The, the burials um, that we see within them involve um, persistence of memories, perhaps the use of markers um, to, to, um, so that they weren't um, sort of redug, you know, and, and, and um, sort of disturbed in that way. But you can tell but from what we've just talked about that, that clearly they were very important kind of um, to the local community to, to, to reinvigorate them, to reuse them, to keep them going um, as part of the memory of that community and keep the, the social ties going and the, and the connections of the land. So the Cossington Cemetery represents a remarkable sort of variety um, of burial that, you know, highlights even that apparently simple round barrows can contain a, a, a very high complexity of remains that can tell a really interesting and remarkable story. The monuments were clearly important to the people who created them, but also though, those that live with them as increasingly ancient monuments. You know, they became the past of the people living in the present. They became the, that, that, those people's history and archaeology. Um, and the different burial traditions show that local traditions, memories, 
appropriations of these monuments were responses to changing the change in needs of the local groups and their interactions with the barrows that helped them understand their place in the world. But they also reflected changing attitudes, memories, and the beliefs of the people. So we can get a real insight into how these monuments were originally used and how they were perceived in the, in the, in the, in the future. Um, so that rather than, you know, as we might expect from looking at them as a simple earthwork or crop mark, that they were used once or twice and then went into, um, you know, that they were quickly forgotten. These were landmarks that retained their significance and sometimes they were remembered and redefined by the later groups that used, um, used them and lived in the landscape that wished to stake a claim on, on the area that they lived in. And I think that's um, about all I can say. Hopefully that's inspired some thoughts.